All right, guys, check this out. Look at this. This is the 1712 transceiver that I've been working on. And I'm most pleased with the glowing numerals. I'm gonna tell you how I did this, but for now, just take a look. This is the band switch, right? So that's in the 17 meter position down. Look at that, boom, 12 meters. Let me do that again, 17. You can hear the, the band noise because the antenna is tuned up for 17 meters. Boom, 12. There's some band noise there, but the antenna's not really tuned for it. Anyway, I'm gonna give you an update on what's been going on with this rig. I uh, First thing is, I cut out a rectangular hole here using my Dremel-like tool. Cutting a rectangular hole is hard. Cutting a circular hole, like the one I have for the speaker, is easy. You just use a circular saw a drill bit. The, the wood is the, I continue to use the scrap wood from the uh, pandemic treadmill uh, delivery. I saved the wood and it's proving useful for another, another dual band rig. <laughs> Cutting the rectangular hole was kind of rough because I used the Dremel, a little sort of cheap knockoff Dremel-like tool with a little circular blade on it. But it got so hot when I was cutting this plywood, the plywood was a little bit thicker than I anticipated. It got so hot that it, it started to smoke a little bit and set off the smoke detector here in the shack. So uh, anyway, that wasn't, that wasn't a whole lot of, whole lot of fun. But I cut out the one rectangular hole and I got the uh, the counter in there. But then I was really sad because I my the counter scheme that I had adopted was really kind of goofy. I was going to take the uh, carrier oscillator signal and the VFO signal, combine them in an SBL1 mixer, run the mixer to a 17 meter and a 12 meter bandpass filter switchable, and then display the frequency. Sounds great, sounds simple, right? But the problem is that you're generating a signal at the operating frequency inside a single conversion receiver. So yeah, I could uh, the, the, the frequency counter worked and it was displaying the proper frequency, but also everywhere I tuned, I was creating a fairly strong detectable uh, signal at the operating frequency. So that was out and I figured out a different way to do it and this avoided when I was for a while there, I thought I was going to have to have two different counters in there. But I remembered a feature of the Sanjian frequency counters, little known. Many of you guys may be using these counters, you don't realize it. But there's a very simple way in which you can set up one of these Sanjian frequency counters to switch it from two different IF schemes. And that's what I did here. And that avoided the problem of having to put another smoke producing rectangular hole in the beautiful front panel of this 1712 transceiver. All right, I'm gonna move the camera forward here a little bit and show you guys the rig and then talk to you a little bit about what's been happening with it. Move it up here. I cleaned a lot of the detritus the remnants that always always sort of finish up a, uh, a homebrew project. Let me see here. Let me move this over here, get the whole transceiver in the screen. Maybe a little bit like this. Uh, let's see, that should do it. All right, all right. Let me get my uh, pen or a ruler, a ruler to point. All right, so one of the first things I'll talk about is when I was building this thing, I'm not blocking the light. When I was building this thing, as you build it and you get to a certain point, you realize, wow, if I were to reverse polarize this thing and put the, the, the voltage in and the reverse polarity, I could blow up a significant portion of circuitry. So I decided, nope, don't want to do that. I heard uh, Pete Giuliano telling me, do reverse polarity protection. So I did some reverse polarity protection. And I put in a fuse. Here comes the power in here, the fuse. And you see this little diode down here? That's a reverse, that's a polarity protection diode. So if you ever put 
polarity in the wrong way, you put the positive to the negative, suddenly this diode will conduct like crazy and blow the fuse here. So reverse polarity protection, I began to sleep easier. A little bit about the IF. The IF really determined by the crystal filter. I have a 10 pole crystal filter here and, and I picked as the IF 21.470 megahertz. And I managed to get these little crystals um, uh, from Mauser. Got a bunch of them for 20, 20, I bought 20 of them. And they were really, they were cheap, easy to get, and they work fine. The, I, I was kind of wondering whether these sort of low cut crystals would work in a filter. Farhan used these similar crystals in one of his filters and it worked fine. I tried it, worked fine for me. And I used some of the different programs available. I measured the parameters of the crystals. I got the motional and capacitive emotional, the inductive motional inductance and the capacitive motional inductance and all that stuff and plugged in and found out what the, um, what the parallel capacitance should be. These are cone, this is a cone configuration filter. Plugged it all in and was happy to find that just happily the, um, the filter was at, at, a, at an imper impedance of 50 ohms at either end. So I did not have to do any kind of impedance matching at either end. That was just a little bit of happy, happy circumstance. And uh, I guess the radio gods have spoken. Um, you can see that I used these TIA boards. I used four of them, two for trans, um, th um, I used six of them, three for transmit, three for receive. And these are from K7TFC, Todd out there in Portland. He had just sent me some around the time that I was building this thing. So I decided to use them and because it added quite a bit of soul to the new machine. Um, I built, oh, let's talk a little bit about the circuitry over here. This circuitry here is the carrier oscillator. And I used one of the crystals, one of the extra crystals, you can see it in there, from the building of the um, crystal filter. I used that for a crystal controlled carrier oscillator actually a variable crystal control because I've got this trimmer and this coil in there that allows me to move the frequency of the carrier oscillator in relationship to the passband of the filter. I found that coming out of here, I needed a little bit of amplification. Mm -hmm. So I put another stage of amplification in there before this, the, the carrier oscillator or balanced modulator signal goes to the little two diode mixer here. And so that was kind of a, an interesting project, but I got it to the level that I needed it. I needed, I, built, I needed a mic amp, and you can probably see the mic amp stuck in here. That's just a single board taken straight out of the micro bit X schematic. It worked fine there, and it, it works fine here. It's a single transistor, no problem at all. Uh, never gave me any trouble. Um, TR switching is all in from the D104 microphone, okay? D104 microphone comes in here, and I have one line that keys the TR relays, and there's various transmit receive relays throughout the circuit. Um, this, when, when, I, when I close the push to talk on the, uh, on the mic, it takes those relays, the other side of the, uh, the, the, the activation coil to ground, boom, the relays file, file, fire, and it goes from receive to, to transmit. I really don't need another TR switch on the front panel because the only time I'm going to be doing it is when I hit the switch. Watch. You can see it's switching. This little board that I have here is the audio amplifier. It's got a little red LED there. <laughs> I don't know what the purpose is, but it helps me because look, when I go to transmit, it turns off that circuit. Boom. You see the light goes out. Boom. Very satisfying. Um, and I've never had any trouble with, with the TR um, relay. All right, I talked earlier on quite a bit about the various the variable frequency oscillator, and that's this whole thing right here. That's the first thing that I built. And I built it around this variable capacitor that Pete Giuliano advised me to get. It's from an old HT37 uh, transmitter, or trans yeah, HT37 transmitter by Halicraft. It's not my HT37 
which remains intact over there at the other end of the shack, but from somebody else's. And they sold me this capacitor. And the, one of the cool things about it is it has these temperature compensation capacitors. You can see them up here at the top. And this little split stator cap that allows you to shift between positive and negative temperature compensation. Really kind of a cool circuit. And I discussed this quite a bit on, on the blog. Um, this thing runs in the 3.5 megahertz range. I needed it to shift a little bit when I was going from 12 to 17. And I think you can see it in here. Let me move the camera up a little bit. All right, there you go. You can see right in here, I have a an NPO trimmer cap right there that switches in. This is this switches when we change bands. And it switches this capacitor in to shift the frequency on this variable frequency oscillator from the, the frequencies that I need for 12 meters to the frequencies that I need for 17 meters. And it works, it works real well. The coil, you can see the air coil core coil, kind of unconventional, but sitting here and just super glued down to the to the board, to the pine board. And I don't want to mess with it because I got it where I want it. This thing now tunes almost exactly and only the entire foam band on 20, uh, the entire foam band on 12 meters and the entire foam meat band on 17 meters. So I'm going to leave that. One thing I'd like to note is I, I've recently been watching the, the videos from WU2D in which he talks about uh, how to build VFOs. And he was relying quite a bit on Frank Harris, um, K0 uh, IYE's book uh, on crystal, from crystals to sideband. One of the things they recommended is that you build the VFO in a hermetically sealed die cast box. I actually bought one, but there was no way I was going to fit this whole mess, especially this big capacitor in the box. And I started thinking about it. And most of the VFOs that we see are not sealed up in a box this way. I just decided to follow a lot of the other good advice that was explained in, in Mike's video. And I ended up with this VFO which is very clearly not sealed up. It's exposed to the world, but I find it remarkably stable because I followed the good practices that Mike and, and Frank outlined in, uh, their, in the book and in the, and in the, the videos that, uh, that, Frank, or that, that Mike did. Um, let's see what else. Um, the bandpass filters. Here are the bandpass filters over here for 17 and 12. And I just went with double tuned circuits and I used the values in the bandpass filters put out by Hans Summers, G0 UPL, on his, um, his wonderful website, um, QRP Labs website. And they work fine. They tweak up really nicely. No problem at all. Um, let's see what else. Oh yeah, how many amplifiers to use? I mean, the original BIDX had an IF amplifier before the crystal filter, an IF amplifier after the crystal filter. Okay, we got that here. And then the original BIDX had RF amplifiers also. I tried to do this without those RF amplifiers, but I found I could not hear the band noise on 17 and 12. So I added amplifier for receive, and then I added an amplifier for transmit, really just to maintain symmetry on the bilateral scheme. And then I can hear the band noise on both bands, so that's that's fine, I kept it. I kept it that way. You know, you can set the gain on all these amplifiers by choosing different uh, feedback and, and uh, degenerative feedback values. And I, I think, I, I think I've, I've kept these low, the RF amplifiers, I kept them low at probably about 10 dB. And these are up higher, I think, 21 to 24 dB. And that seems to work out pretty well. But I need to kind of develop my measuring ability and, and my uh, skills in receiver design. I talked about that. Um, let's see. What else we have here? Oh, yeah. This is I, on the RF amplifier. These are the RF amplifier stages over here. And I left a lot of space because I don't like a whole lot of kind of feedback and howling and problems. Um, the original BIDX design uses a lot of IRF 510s, but these 
devices kind of run out of, out of steam um, as you go up in frequency. So Pete Giuliano recommended the use of an RD006 HHF1 from Motorola. And I have it in there. Boom. It works fine, and it doesn't seem to run out of speed. Uh, I, it, you know, how much bias you put on it, I think they talk about five, around 5 volts. I didn't have a regulator for 5 volts, but I had an 8-volt regulator, and it goes through a dropping a pot that drops it down, and, and that, that provided the, the, needed, the needed bias for it. No problems there at all. Um, I have the LP filter up here. I built an LP filter. They have, I just have the LP filter for uh, for 24 megs. I didn't build a, sec, a separate one for, for 17. Um, I think that's probably okay, especially since I have uh, LP filter for 12 and an LP filter for, for 17, a separate one in the amplifier that I use most of the time. One of, the, one of the questions I had, should I run the unreceived, should I run the incoming signal through the LP filter and then bring it into the receiver, or should I just run it from here into the bandpass filters, into the mixer and through that? Is there a benefit in running the received signal also through the low-pass filter? I kind of don't think so, but um, I'm in a very high RF environment here, so it might, it might help a little bit. Now... Um, Let's see, we talked, what else do I need to talk about? Oh yeah, about the, um, this device over here, the, uh, the, the frequency readout device. I told you I'd tell you a little bit more about that. Well, I built the circuitry needed for that on this little board that is back, actually connected to the back of the Sanjian, um, frequency counter board, just attached it right there. And basically what I did was on 12 meters, all I needed to do was to plug in the IF frequency and then tell the, uh, on for that band, tell the Sanjian counter to add to the IF frequency, whatever it was detecting from the VFO. So that's what you see. That's what happens when you go here on 12 meters. 17 meters is a bit complicated more complicated. So what I did on 17, it's more complicated because the only thing that the Sanjian counter does is it subtracts the IF frequency from the VFO frequency. Here the IF frequency is 21.47, the VFO is around 3.5. Obviously you end up with a negative number and when the counter gets a negative number it displays 0000. zero, zero, zero. So what I did is I ran a little mixer. I put an 11 megahertz crystal in here and combined it, and combined in an NE602, the 11 megahertz and the 3.5 megahertz in subtraction. I subtracted the two. I built a, 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 an LC filter that would select the difference product. Difference product was about seven megahertz. And then I set the IF value here at around uh, 10.5, something like that megahertz, told it to add and then that works out perfectly. Now you got to measure carefully what your I, what your actual carrier oscillator frequency is, but that's the scheme that I worked off. So when, when I throw this switch to 17, actually what I'm doing is I'm turning on the uh, NE602 mixer. I'm turning on the internal oscillator at 11 megahertz. It's actually a little bit more complicated, and I'm switching the IF that's programmed in there, the IF frequency. But the end result is that on 12. It displays the frequency properly, and on 17, it displays the frequency properly. Kind of an interesting way to approach this problem. I kind of liked it because I, I had the machine here. I built this machine, but it, the display part of it wasn't working right, and I had to sit around and noodle. It took me longer than I thought it, that it should have to come up with the solution, especially since I had done this solution before, back when I was building the hodgepodge transceiver during the uh, the pandemic. This was a solution that I came up with that allowed me to use a digital display on the BitX40 board. But I kind of, I kind of wasn't thinking about it. I kind of came up with this crazy solution of building the, uh, of combining the carrier oscillator and the VFO. You can see the circuit, this is the circuit I built here with, a, with an SBL1 and 
These are the SBL1 and two bandpass filters switched by a relay, a little J310 amplifier. It works great, except coming out of this amplifier, you have a very strong signal at the operating frequency. Yuck, boom. So we didn't, we didn't do it. Now, the other big advantage is that when you go to transmit, the, the displayed frequency stays pretty much the same. Watch, get a little glitch, but look, it's the same. Boom, receive, transmit, receive, transmit. I really love this rig. I mean, I, I, I've had great contact tacks with it. I've had all kinds of DX contacts with it. And it reminds me very much of the early DSB rigs that I built out in the Azores, 2000 to 2003. I, I had a feeling that these rigs, when you finished building these machines, they were like magic carpets that would sort of transport your voice across the ocean. And that's the feeling I get from this thing. I really, I like this one. I like that it, there was some problem solving involved in it. I like that it's different. This is the kind of rig, one of the few rigs that I built where I said, geez, you know, other guys might want to build this, especially with cycle 25 kicking in. 12 meters will be getting more active. 17 will be getting more active. Both these bands are kind of immune from the uh, the contest craziness that we see on the non-warp bands. So there's another reason to build it. Now, again, this is not a <laughs> the kind of project where somebody said where, where I would supply somebody with a schematic and a bill of materials. This is more just a this is how I did it project. And... Um, you, you could try to build your own. The only thing I, the only information I would say that is really useful and applicable to other projects is the fact that for 17 and 12, the crystal IF frequency of 21.47 um, seems to work fine. I don't detect a lot of birdies. I don't, I don't see any other spur problems or anything like that coming up. So this might be a good way for somebody who wants to build a 17, 12 rig to do it. I have an internal speaker here. I went with a smaller speaker because I wanted to try to keep metal away from the coil. So I put the speaker right here and uh, the three inch, it's a three inch speaker that I got from um, from the internet. And uh, it works, it worked from Adafruit. I got it from Adafruit as a matter of fact, through Amazon and it seems to work fine. So anyway, that's what's been happening with this rig. I'll continue to update you folks on it. Obviously, I'm going to put some side panels and maybe a top panel on it, and then I'll move it over to the operating bench. And I think I'm going to have to get a better antenna for this thing. Guys, I'm thinking about a hex beam. K4, what is it? IO hex beam, something like that. Uh, I'm thinking about it because uh, it, it would be great fun to run this thing into uh, a hex beam as the uh, sol solar cycle improves. Let me know what you think. Should I do that? Seems kind of uh, wrong to connect a simple rig like this that cost me almost nothing to a, a more expensive commercial antenna, but it might be the time to do that. Anyway, that's it for now. Thanks very much for, for watching. Let me know what you think. Please subscribe down below and please post comments on, on what you think about this project. 7-3 from Northern Virginia. This is Bill N2CQR.